Thank you, Reva. Lovely to be here, and I wish everybody Chodesh Tov. Um, I'd like to dedicate today's learning Le'ilu Nishmas, my mother in law, Broria Bas Shlomo, and my aunt, um, Yehudis Bas Meir, and they both passed away just, you know, in, in the last um, seven months, less than seven months, my mother in law, Hanukkah, and um, my aunt at the end of January. And may, may their Nishmas have an aliyah in the Zechus of our learning. And um, so, I'm actually going to talk this week about the Parsha and about Parsha's Korach, and specifically about who was responsible for Korach's rebellion. And you might think to yourself, well, that's a stupid question. You've just called it Korach's rebellion. The Sedra, the Parsha this week, is called Korach. So Korach clearly is in charge of the rebellion. So let's look. I have a different theory. Okay, so it starts off, everyone who's, who's got their sheet, um, I just realised that people on Zoom don't have the sheet and I don't have a way to show it. So, um, mm, I will try, I'll send it to you afterwards, I'm sorry about that. I'll try and read out as much as possible. Okay, so I'm going to, of course I'm going to say it, thank you, I've got my little helper over there. Okay, so the first thing we can look at is the very first posuk of this week's Sedra, which is Bamidbar, if someone wants to look up in Chumash, Bamidbar Tes Zion Posuk Aleph. And this is the headline in the newspaper when the rebellion started. Vayikach Korach ben Kahos, ben Yitzhar ben Kahos ben Levi. And Korach, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kos, the son of Levi, so we know his whole pedigree, took, we don't know what he took, but basically he took himself aside. He got involved in a dispute. He wasn't happy with Moshe's leadership. It's very ambiguous what he did. And who else is involved in the dispute? Dosan v'aviram. Dosan Aviram, B'nai Eliyav, the sons of Eliyav, the Om Ben Peles, and a man called Om Ben Peles, who we only hear about this time, we never hear about him again, B'nai Ruvain. They are from the tribe of Ruvain, the son Eliyav is their father, and he is um, from the family of Ruvain. Just as a very small side point, it's a sheer in its own right, Om Ben Peles drops out the story, the Midrash tells us he was saved by his wife. It's nothing's written in the Torah about that. It's because he's in the story and he gets out the story. If you want to know more, please go the next time there's a Rosh Chodesh group, I'll do a class just on what happens to Om Ben Peles. Okay, so this is, this is, this is, this is the headline in the newspaper. Okay, the question I want to ask you is, why did people from the tribe of Reuven get involved in the dispute? Now, the Levian was set aside as being holy and they were separate and Moshe was from that family and Korach was his, was his cousin. So Korach was the royal family, so to speak. You know, think William and think, you know, Pinch Princess Beatrice. Royal family, at least, if she's going to make uh, an attempt to get the leadership, she should at least come from the tribe of Levi. What's someone from the tribe of Ruve muscling himself in there? Now, originally, Ruve may have been, it should have been initially, that the firstborn, Ruve was the firstborn to Yaakov, should have been the people who inherited the right to be the leaders and get the double portion. But through various things, another whole share for another whole time, why it got passed to Levi and Levi, the Levium and the Kohanim, who are a branch of the Levi family, Aaron's family, served in the base Hamikdash. And that, incidentally, is one of the reasons why initially it would have been the firstborns, why if someone has a baby boy and they don't come from the tribe of Levi and it's the first baby issued from the womb, we have pigeon our bed. Because they should have, almost like the Levium, have substituted them in their service of the base Hamikdash. If we should have the base Hamikdash, may it come, may it be rebuilt speedily in our days. So why did the people in Reuven get involved? It's a good question, right? You're thinking, there's a coup. And why is anyone in Ruven involved? So for that, we need to look at Rashi. Again, it's Perek Tes Zion Aleph 16.1. And Rashi tells us the following. Bishvil Shehoya Shevet Ruven Shoroi Bechanu Som Temona. Because the tribe of Ruven was close by and they camped in the south, Shochen Likahos Uvanov Hachonim Temona. They were neighbours of Kahos. So the camp was like... Um, a big square, and the tribes of camps, three over here, three over here, three over here, and in the middle was the Mishkan and the tribe of Levi. So Levi and Kahos was in the south, and they very, very near Reuven. So what's Rashi telling us that for? Because there's obviously a reason he's saying, what's, the question Rashi's asking is, what have they got to do with it? Are they just nosy parkers? Why are they involved in the dispute? And Rashi tells us, 
Nishtat Fu im Korach Bamachra Koso. They got involved with Korach and his disagreement because we know a famous adage, Ola Rosha, Ola Shechena. Woe is to the wicked one, woe is to his neighbours. We have an English proverb. If you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. Be careful who you keep company with. And who is my Latin expert here? I've got a feeling, Adele. Who can read Latin? Okay, go for a riff, guy. Thank you. Um, there you go. That's exactly that. It's exactly that. Cannabis is your dog, and the is the fleas. If you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. Be very. Translations here. I already said the translation. Okay. Well, it's good because canine is cannabis. Okay. Next time I'll have to have something in French, and we'll see if uh, your chevet can translate it. So this opens up a whole discussion about the power of influence. Who lives near you? Who do you get influenced by? Now, all you lovely ladies hang out with each other. You go to Shurim. People even went yesterday. They even go tomorrow. Whatever. But some people, you know, especially people who bring up young families, you want to be careful who your kids are friendly with, where they hang out, which school you send them to, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole nature nurture, nurture debate. What influence is the environment on a person and how careful we have to be? to keep ourselves and our children, grandchildren, whatever, if we've got any say, um, away from bad influences. We don't want to land up, you know, smoking behind the bike shed. It's not, you know, certainly not taking drugs. You don't want to get in with the wrong crowd, basically. Now, so Rashi's telling us they lived near Kahos. And Reuven lived nearby and just telling you, just be careful. You get involved in a dispute. Your neighbor gets involved in a dispute. You get sucked in. And that is just hiding there by te- just the rush, is, the rush is just telling us, what are Reuven doing there? We all, we all know that's the Posik and the Torah. It's the first Posik of the Sedra. But what's going on there? There's something. Why is the Torah bothering to tell us? So the Sifzei Chachamim tells us, that they had no personal interest in the dispute. They just got influenced as, as, as they lived nearby and they, weren't, they were the firstborns. They, they were not necessarily the firstborn of their own family, but they were from the tribe of Reuven. Um, now, the story of Korah carries on that 250 people get involved and they all say, we don't need Moshe, we don't need a leader, but it's so funny, that argument doesn't make any sense because what they're saying is, we don't need a leader, but I'm the leader. So it's a bit like, I think in, um, in The Lion King, if you've seen it, they say, we don't need a king, but I'm going to be the king. Well, what do you mean you don't need a king? You don't want him to, you don't want Mufasa to be the king, but you're saying, I want to get rid of the king. Who needs a king? And then he wants to be the king. So you can't have it both ways. So um, they're saying no leader. We're all amazing. We don't need a leader. We're all capable. We were all at Sinai. We all know. And then, but then they actually want to take control of the leadership as well. So what is going on here? So um, Moshe goes to Korach and he tries to speak to him twice and to the people twice. But then this happens. Moshe tries to diffuse the situation. And this is going to be point one in my argument for suggesting that in fact, the real rabble rousers were what I call double trouble. And they are Dosan and Aviram. Look at what happens. This is in um, Perek uh, Tessayin Posuk Yud Base, chapter 16, verse 12. Vayishlach, source three, Vayishlach Moshe likro le doson la aviram, b'nei Eliyav. And Moshe calls to, so he, could, he, he sends, uh, someone should call doson la aviram. He wants to sort of have a word with them. Vayomru, and they said, lo na'ale, we will not go up. And in fact, they could have said, lo, vayomru lo, and they didn't want to come. It doesn't say that. It said, they said, we will not go up. And in fact, this foretells their terrible demise because, in fact, towards the end of the story, they go down into the depths of the earth and they definitely don't go up, they go down. When you say, we, uh, sorry, um, we will not come up, a prayer. They will not come up to Moshe. Why is the, why is the phrase, Vayomru lo na'ale, we will not come up? You could argue that it could be a nice language, they were not going to go up to maybe Moshe was more north or more high, I don't know. But the fact is, it didn't have to say that. It could have said, Vayomru lo. 
And they said, no. Or we will not come. We will not come. Yeah. Or, lo, lo navo. Lo, lo. So that means that we're to look up to him. Well, maybe. Maybe they're sort of saying that we won't go up. But either way, it's sort of predicting their downfall because they yeah. did go down, down, they down into the depths down. of the earth. Now, so my first point is that why is Moshe going to Dosan Avira? So I'm suggesting they are there and they are the, they are, they are somehow involved much more than we think, because they sort of get mentioned after Korach, because we're calling it Korach's Rebellion, Korach's Dispute. But I'm saying is that I think, according to the Mepharshim, that some opinions, there are other opinions who say Korach is a big fat troublemaker, but I'd like to suggest that Dosan and Aviram were heavily involved as well. But what I want to say from this, just that you see that Moshe himself goes to sort of uh, try and reconcile with them. He thinks, I've got no luck with Korach. I'm going to go and see Dosan and Aviram. We have Rashi who comments on that Posuk, Tes Zion Posuk Yud Beis. How incredible, think about it. Moshe Rabbeinu is appointed by Hashem. He's the head of the whole community. And he tries to go out of his way to try and reconcile the situation and try and sort of convince Dosan and Aviram to get away from the rebellion and not get involved in a dispute. What Rashi maybe he says. Wanted to keep his place. He yeah, maybe he, he wanted to keep his place. Okay, but look what Rashi says. He brings the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin. Yes, it could be that he wanted to keep his place. Although we are told that Moshe didn't really want the leadership when he was told at the burning bush, I want you to go and speak to Pharaoh. He's like, Who am I? I don't have I've got a bad pair of Aras of Asayim. I don't speak well, let's choose someone else. Why'd you pick me? Didn't really want to do it. He was a bit of a reluctant leader. And they say he was on of Mikhail Odom. He didn't feel he was the person who should be chosen. I'm not sure it could be. Because he doesn't want because he doesn't want dispute. Right, he didn't want to necessarily be the leader, mm -hmm. but he doesn't want to dispute. Okay? Rashi tells us, he brings the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin, Mikan She'ein machzikim b'machlokes. Look how amazing Moshe Rabbeinu is. We learn from here that you shouldn't hold on and prolong arguments. Get away from arguments. If there's an argument, try and can't get some sort of, you know, reconciliation. Shehoya Moshe machaze acharehem. He followed after them. He tried to find them. Lahashli mom b'divrei shalom. He tried to find a way that he could get to a peaceful resolution and not make things worse, which I think is incredible if you think about it. Do you think if someone had an argument with the prime minister that he would like call them and say, hey, do you want to come in and see me? Let's discuss. You wouldn't even get an audience if you had an argument but with, you know, the, with, the, with, the, with the, the premier. They would have wanted to topple him over yeah. and yeah. put somebody else at, their, uh, at the head. So is, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure I understand that there's an argument. That why he went to see them. But were, were they arguing? Or were they just saying, we don't want you anymore, we want somebody else? It's unclear from the actual story, but it seems to be 250 men rose up against Moshe and they said, we are all holy, why do we need you? They were not, they were pretending that they didn't need anyone, but really, in fact, Korach wanted to take the leadership and they didn't, they were like, we, we, we all, why you, not me? Yeah. It's, it's just generally disgruntled <laughs> um, behaviour. Yeah. So Moshe then foretells the opening of the earth and that he says that the troublemakers are going to um, descend alive and a flame is going to consume the 250 men. Ooh. And then he says what's going to happen is that the pans that they were going to offer up the incense in um, were bashed in. The, this is what was going to happen. They're going to be melted down and to be a covering for the Mizbeach, the altar in the Mishkan, to be a warning, to remind people that Hashem was the one who had to be something really remarkable and spectacular to prove that Moshe was the chosen leader and he, didn't, he wasn't self-appointed. Just before this happens, Moshe tries again to talk to Dustin Avram, and that's why I'd like to say that there's something going on here more than the fact that it's just Korach in charge. Why does Moshe come to see Dosan and Aviram? So for that, we're looking at Posuk, Kafhei and, um, Kaf and onwards. Vayakom Moshe, Vayelech el Dosan v'Aviram. Moshe Rabbeinu gets up and he goes to Dosan and Aviram. And just think about that. He tried and he called them saying, come in, let's have a meeting in my office. And they said, actually, get lost, we're not coming. And then Moshe himself gets up and goes to try and speak to them. How incredible is that? But also, um, you see what Rashi says there. Why did Moshe go to them? Because source six, it's the Rashi on Tess Zion Cafe. Because he thought 
that they would show him some sort of respect and speak to him. And if he personally went round to grovel and say, come on, let's, let's, let's get to some agreement here. Don't get involved in the dispute. It doesn't matter. You don't stand to gain anyway. But they did not. They did not. They did not. Okay, let's carry on with the Pesukim. So if you look, Pesuk Kafov, this is source five. Vayadaber el ha'ed alema, and Hashem, Moshe said to the people saying, the name of the congregation, Suru no me'al ahole ha'anashim ha'reshotim ha'ele. Go away from these wicked people. Remember, it's got the word reshotim, wicked people. Av'al tigu b'chol ashelohem, and don't, um, touch anything that's next to them. Pentisofu bechol chatosom, lest you get sucked in and um, wiped out um, with their sin. Vayalume al mishkan korach dosan vaaviram misaviv, and the people got up and left, got up and from away from where they lived. The dosan naviram and uh, sorry, and from where korach and dosan vaaviram lived. The dosan vaaviram yotzu. Nitzovim and Dosan Naviram went out standing. Pesach Ohalehem, opposite the entrance to their tent. Unashehem, Uvanehem, Vatapom. Their wives, their children, and their infants. And in fact, later on when they die, their wives and their children, their infants also die. Mm. And it's all a question about why their children should have mm. suffered. Mm. Difficult, difficult subject to discuss. That's quite horrible. It's really a horrible story. It's a horrible story. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But we're going to focus on something a bit nicer than a horrible story. Um, so, Dosan Naviram, um, I hope I made it bold in your thing. I wrote on it, Yotsu Nitsovim. Can anyone explain to me what's difficult with they came out standing? Because the rabbis are like, what on earth is that? They came out standing. They would have been walking out. Well, so either you're walking out, but how can you be standing? Either You can't do both. You're going... Isn't there something with the meaning of Nitsovim is like... Sort of the way you behave, right? Yeah. So there is an idea. So it, it comes from from Goliath, who was there's the ver same verb of Nitzovim is standing, and he was belittling um, Shaul and the Jewish nation. So that's where the the, the Medrash brings it from. Um, You've also got like the Pasha at him Nitzovim. Right? Of course, yes. So it means standing firm. Okay, so standing firm. So there is, it's a bit of an oxymoron to say standing, going out, standing. Either you're standing, which is static, or you're moving by going out. You can't be moving and standing at the same time. So how do we explain that? Is so... Are they were inflexible about it all? Yes. So defiant. Defiant, yeah. excellent. But they were making a stand against it. They were taking a stand. So in English, it works, in English it works brilliantly, because yeah. to stand, yeah. you can stand your ground, yeah. you can stand yeah. firm, yeah. you can stand up for what you believe in, yeah. Yeah. you can take a stand, okay? Yeah. As someone yeah. says, you can sit in a stand, which is quite funny. Yeah. You, can, yeah. you can stand yeah. proud, yeah. you can stand tall, yeah. or you can't stand. stand. So you can stand off, thank you. You can have a standoff. Lovely, Charlie, thank you. You can also, you can't stand someone. So they don't all mean standing. You can stand down. Lovely, I'm going to write that down as well. Okay. Stand up for your rights. Yeah, stand up for your rights, yeah. Yeah, stand up for your rights. Absolutely stand up for your rights. Okay, so there is a way for us to explain it. But Rashi tells us what on earth standing up, sitting, standing up and walking at the same time. So look at source seven on your sheet. This is Rashi, um, Tess Zion, um, um, Kaf Zion. What were they doing? How can we understand the word standing up, but they're going out? Rashi says, Bekoma Zakufa. They stood with an erect stature. They were sort of standing almost like ready, you know, in a punching stance. Uh, ready, l'choreif u'l'gadeif, with a challenging attitude, ready to revile and to curse. So they, they were defiant. I like that word, defiant. I'm going to write that down. Okay, so they actually hardly get mentioned in Tanakh at all, which is really surprising. They're only mentioned nine times in the Torah. But, but, but it's sort of like... There's something mainly in Parshas Korach, a little bit in, uh, in, in Devarim, and another time in Parshas Pinchas. 
Why are the rabbis trying to point fingers at Dosan and Aviram? There's some sort of subtext are we unaware of? Let's see. So what I want to tell you is a little, we're going to do a little bit of a story. Oh, it's already so late. Um, um, we're going to tell a story of Dosan and Aviram and they are hiding, according to the Midrash, in lots of unexpected places. The first place is when Moshe was born. After he was born, he, um, Pyro's daughter saves him, and then um, he goes out and he sees the people, and they're working very, very hard at work. And he sees, one day, he sees an Egyptian hitting an Israelite. And this is in Shamos Perak base, Posuk Yud Gimel. No names are mentioned, except we know Moshe's in the story. Look with me, source eight on your sheet. Vayetse Bayom Hasheni. And he went out on the second, so on, so on the first day, he goes out, he sees an Egyptian hitting an Israelite. Moshe gets involved, he kills the Egyptian, and then the following day, Vayetse Bayom Hasheni, Vehine Shnei Anoshim Ivrim Nitzim. There were two Israelites fighting, no names. Vayome Lorosha, and he says to the wicked one, now where have we heard the word Roshaim just before? Lomo Sakerecha, why are you hitting your friend? Vayomer, and well, let's hear the story. Vayomer, and he said, he, so this is the person's replying, Mi somcho le ish savashafet olenu. Who are you? Why are you, think yourself, appointed as a police officer over us? Now, this is basically the problem. Whoever's involved in the story does not like authority. And he's saying to Moshe, who do you think you are? Why are you getting involved and in policing the situation? Are you threatening? Are you saying you're going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Vayira Moshe, and Moshe was very frightened. Vayomar, and he said, no dahadava, the matter is surely known. Now, if you remember the story from the day before, I haven't, I didn't say it, but we say that Moshe looked and it says, Vayifen kovacho, and he looked this way and that way, Vayar ki ein ish, and he saw there was no man. If no one saw the story happening, how do these two people know it? So, so they, there was no real man. Okay, yeah, there's lots of explanations about Vayifen Kovacho, there was no real man, there was no one else to get there, so Bimkom She'ein Ish Hishtardel Yoshes, if no one else is there to stand up, you've got to stand up. But the, but, the, but the rabbis tell us what happened was, the very man he saved the day before said to him the following day, who do you think you are getting involved in a dispute? Let's remember that the day before Moshe saved his life when he was being beaten up by the hands of the Egyptians. And believe me, the taskmasters were not, um, they were not, they were heavy handed, put it that way. Are they inferring in fair, in that maybe these two men were Dotan and... They are, that's what the Chazal yes. tell us at Sosan yeah. Aviram, okay? So, Vayishma um, Paro, and Paro got to hear Es Hadova Hazer, this matter, Vayivakesh Laharog Es Moshe. And they wanted to kill Moshe. Vayivrach Moshe Mipne Paro. And Moshe had to run away. And he went to live in Midian, and that's where he met Yisro, and he met the daughters at the well, etc., etc. And he married Sipara. Rashi tells us, this is um, Posuk, um, Perak base, Posuk Tesvov, 215. How did Paro hear? Guess who told them? Haim Hil Shino Alov. They ratted him out. Who was rest him out? Dosa and Naviram. And in fact, the Sifse Cohen said that they got money. So there must have been a wanted poster saying, mm -hmm. wanted, who, if anyone got any information, mm -hmm. I will pay handsomely, rewarded handsomely, if you tell us who killed my Egyptian taskmaster on day one. So the rabbis tell us it was, um, it was Dosan and Aviram. Not so nice when he saved your life the day before. Mm -hmm. The Yalkut Shimoni, source 10, tells us, Kol mashe ata yachol litlos brashayim tola. Anything you want to blame on Dosa and Aviram, blame them. They deserve it. Whatever you give them, give them. And in fact, the Medrash and Shemos Rabba tells us they were the ones that left over the Mon. They were the ones who say in Bamidbar Yud Tes, which is oh. before Parshas Korach, Nitna Rosh Shuva Mitzrayma. We're not so happy in the wilderness. We're not so happy. Can you please appoint a new head and we're going to go back to Egypt? So there you go. They don't want the authority again and again and again. And according to the Chazal, they rebelled at the Yam Suf. Mm -hmm. um, this is very surprising. Um, 
I'm gonna have to leave the next bits out, so I'm terribly sorry about that. Let's go to number 13. The rabbis tell us there's another place which source 12 was, it says that someone met Aaron and Moshe, um, Nitzovim Likros, on the word Nitzovim again, I, I can't go into too much detail. And so the rabbis tell us on that pasuk, Rabbi Senu Darshu Kol Nitzim Venitzovim. Every time we see source thirteen, Shemos Rashi on Shemos five Hey Kaf, rabbis tell us every time you see the word Nitzovim or Nitzim without a subject, without we knowing who it is, unidentified person, it is Dosan and Aviram because Nitzim is arguing, Nitzovim is standing in a defiant manner. And therefore, you have to know that every time you see that, it's always going to be Dosan and Aviram. But I mean, weren't they slaves and they were in Egypt? So they were under the authority of Pharaoh, weren't they? So they didn't like how come they behaved then and they let, they didn't rebel there. Well, sometimes leadership. some people can cope underneath certain leadership, but then when they've got another leadership, they're not happy. Say, for example, if you're, in a, if you're on a committee and there's the president of the committee, let's say it's a shul committee, right? There's a chairman and you're happy. You don't mind if Rifka's the head of the chair. Then she gets replaced by someone. And you think, I don't want to work with that person. I don't, I'm not interested. They I, weren't actually like partners here, were they? They were slaves. Yeah. Mm. We're going to look at what, what they were in Egypt very, very shortly. What I was going to ask you was, if they were such troublemakers and they constantly caused Moshe problems throughout his life and even told Paro about him and got him into trouble, why, how come they're still alive at this part of the desert? Because we, we, there's a medrash that says that majority of people who didn't deserve to be let out of Egypt died in the plague of darkness. So we, we, get, we get that from the words chamushim olu, the, a fifth went up. It could be they went up armed, but it could be they went up a fifth, because from the word chamesh, a fifth or ar, it could be armed like they went up armed. But there's a medrash which says the people who didn't deserve to come out of Egypt died and perished in the plague of darkness. So that the Egyptians never knew anything happened to them, but they never deserved to come out and they didn't leave. How did they survive? They must have had some merit. And what was their merit? So I'm not going to look at this inside, um, but I'll, I'll just talk to you about it. It's source 19. In Shemos, um, Perek, um, Perek Hay, we are told the story of Moshe trying to interfere. And he says to, goes to Pharaoh and he says to Pharaoh, please, can you give us some time off? We want to have a bit of time off. We're going to worship in the desert. And Moshe and Pharaoh says, right, you've got spare time in your life. I'll tell you what, I'm going to take away the straw. And then he started making the lives difficult for the people and the people complained bitterly and it was absolutely terrible. But there was a circumstance, there were circumstances by which in Egypt, there were two levels of slaves because uh, Jochevin, you mentioned this. There were slaves, but very similar to the Nazi ideology yeah. in World War II, oh, where they made, they made the car pose, where they made the Jewish prisoners themselves have some sort of Jewish police force. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, there's an understanding, because if you look at the words, there's Shotrim, the police officers who were Shvayaku Shotre B'nai Israel. They were members of the B'nai Israel who were appointed as police officers, like the Judenrat. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was also the Nogshe Paro, the taskmasters. So this is how it went. The, Paro and his, you know, entourage appointed taskmasters and they were Egyptians and they were the ones, like you can imagine, standing there with the whips ready to like watch what people were doing. But they didn't want to do all the dirty work. So what they did was they applied, they, they, they employed the services, well, without paying them, of the Jews and they made them policemen over their f fellow Israelites. I say Jews, Israelites, I should just say Israelites, okay? <laughs> which made, it's a, it's, a, it's a form of torture really, isn't it? And then there's almost infighting, because then if I'm the policeman and I'm telling you what to do, you're like, who do you think you are? Why are you telling me what to do? This and that and the other. Yeah. Now, when the Jews did not manage to fulfill their quota of the right amount of bricks, yeah. so the, the Egyptian taskmasters went to the Jewish police officers and said, hey guys, well, they probably didn't say it that much nicely. They said, you haven't fulfilled the quota. What's going on now? So what happens? So then they have to go up to the slaves and then say to them, you haven't filled your quota. But we have an understanding that Dosan and Aviram were appointed some of these capos. They were, they were these Jewish policemen. 
and the Maharal Diskin tells us, this is source 20 in your sheet, Dosan for Aviron, Hayu Bain Hashotrim, Shemostru at Smom al Yisrael, the Sovlu Makos Kade la Hokel Avoda, my Alban Israel. He tells them, do you know why Dosan and Aviron managed to get out of Egypt? They had an amazing merit. This is, a, this is a medrash that the Maharil brings. He doesn't say where he got it from, that they were amongst the officers and they sacrificed themselves for the children of Israel and they took a beating in order to lighten the work of the children of Israel. Because they sacrificed themselves and bore physical pain in order to lighten the burden of the children of Israel, a special merit is attributed to them. And so much so that the Yalkut Shimoni, which is source 21 on your sheet, tells us they sacrificed themselves at the hands of the taskmasters and the, the, the Egyptian taskmasters. And they said to themselves, let me just write down the word Egyptian so I don't forget. They said to themselves, it's better that we should take a beating than the rest of the people. Therefore, when Hashem said to Moshe in Bar Midbar, um, Perek Yud Aleph, Osfali Shivim Ish, Get, gather for me some 70 elders to help run the nation. Moshe didn't know who to choose. Who should he choose? And Hashem said to him, he, he said to him, how am I going to know who to choose? And Hashem said to him, you have to pick the elders and the officers who sacrificed themselves mm -hmm. and were beaten up for the sake of other people in Egypt. And that is incredible. And the, so the Medrash tells us that even though Dos and Aviram were difficult customers and they made life, Moshe's life a bit difficult, to say the least. From here we can learn that anyone who dedicates himself for the sake of Israel merits honour, glory, and according to some opinions, even prophecy. Which I think is quite remarkable because Dosan and Aviram get very, very bad press. So they didn't want to be, they didn't want to replace Moshe, they wanted somebody else to replace Moshe. Maybe they wanted somebody else to replace Moshe. Maybe they knew that they couldn't be because they were, they were from the tribe of Ruvain. Mm -hmm but they didn't want Moshe for whatever reason. Maybe it's an old vendetta because if yeah. they were the ones yeah. who yeah. who were fighting and then Moshe intervened in the fighting and he, the other thing is, I mean, I've just thought about it now, that, uh, that Dosson was the one who was fighting, was beholden. And sometimes when you are, when someone is beholden to you, somehow it's not good. It's like, mm -hmm. That joke saying, oh, I know why she's not talking to me, but I don't know why she's talking to me. I haven't, uh, I haven't given her any money. You know, there's like a joke. It says, I, that I know why she's broigers with me, but, you know, I haven't, what's her problem? She, I haven't lent her any money. So, um, but it, Dawson was beholden to Moshe. And then sometimes people can't get over it. It's, 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 just, it's just, you cannot ever, it's a very difficult thing. You have to be very strong to... Um, <laughs> to get over something when, you, when you're beholden. And yet he was the one that had reported Pharaoh. They reported him to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, yes, because they couldn't take it. Yeah. They couldn't take it. He owed, but he owed his life to Moshe. Think about it. And also yeah. owed yeah. his life to Moshe. Yeah. That's but just a side day, point I just thought know, about. It. You sort of get the picture that they, they didn't like the idea that the leader, they're just told this is the leader. And they didn't sort of have any say in appointing a leader. Yeah. You know, they've just got oh, to accept true. that. Shem but I think also it's a leader. personal vendetta. I never thought about it before, but as I was speaking, I think that he, uh, that I think that he, um, that he felt, Mo that Dosson felt beholden to Moshe. What's really interesting, that in Parshas Pinchas, there's a plague and then there's a national census. And the tribe of Reuven is mentioned first. And when they mention, this is source 21 or 22 on your sheet, it says, Uvene Eli of the Muel Dosan for Aviram. I'll just spit. Asher hits U al Moshe, who fought against Moshe, the Al Aaron, but Adas Korach. And the earth swallowed its mouth. And they died and they got swallowed. And they died with their children and their babies. Uvene Korach lo Mesu. And the children of Korach did not die. And according to them, there's, a, there's a, one of the Hillim says, Mishmar Shiliv Ne Korach. There is the idea that Korach's children actually did, did do Teshuvah. Mm. But does it state that uh, Korach's children came and stood out with them? No. The no, like that's really interesting. You know, like in the, um, the Possum. Yeah. yeah, no, I didn't bring them all, but 
No, it doesn't speak about them. Really interesting. But it doesn't include that's that's so that's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing it. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't speak about Korah's children. We don't know anything about them. But we we hear that they didn't die. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. But even when they met, even when the Torah mentions Dos and Aviram in the census, it says they were the ones who joined Korah's rebellion and they died. Blah blah blah. Now here we have just uh, before we finish is um, the Or HaChaim who basically says every. It's all Dosan and Aviram. He asks the question is, why is it that they died and their whole family gets cut off and Korach's children, Korach hardly even gets a mention. It says, Vativla os, oh, you haven't got the posse there for you, but Vativla osam es Korach, but Eda, but it talks about Dosan and Aviram twice that they died. And it's like mentions that they were part of the people who fought against Moshe in the congregation of Korach. And it's just surprising that um, the Orachim says, I'm telling you now, Korach is almost gets away without the blame. It's because, it's because Dosan and Aviram were the biggest fat troublemakers. This is what the Orachim says. He passed away in 1743, mm -hmm. uh, Rab Achaim um, Ben Moshe Ibn Attar. And he says, this is all 24 on your sheet. If you want to look it up at home, it's Orachim Bamidbar Kaf Vov Tes. Vinireh, Ki lo bo'o ha kosov kan, ela lo ma, shehein heina ha yusiba lechol maase korach. They get a special mention here, and we hear that they were the ones who fought against korach, because to tell you that what they did, they were the cause of korach's rebellion. Ki yach potz Hashem lefarsem ha reshaim, shehein siba la resha ha naase. They, Hashem wanted to publicize the names of these wicked people because they were the perpetrators and they were the orchestrators of the evil in question. Um, hey, um, they were responsible from start to finish. And we can learn from here that if it wasn't for the two demagogues, um, Dasan and Aviram, the Israelites who had gathered threateningly, threateningly, threateningly against Moshe, would have repented if it wasn't for these two people. So really, it's nothing to do with Karach at all. I mean, according to some opinions, oh, according to the opinion that I'm going with. All right, okay. <laughs> Further proof that Dosan and Aviram were the masterminds behind the rebellion and everyone else was their puppets and they probably wanted Korach to be sort of, have the royal blood, so they had to have someone as their figurehead yeah. to say, yeah. we want Moshe's cousin to be the, yeah, the royal thing. They kind of used Korach, didn't they? They, uh, that's according to yes, according to this idea. This, according yeah, to this yeah, idea, yeah. there are other opinions. Okay. Yeah, you'll speak out better than we can. In Devorim, yeah. in Devorim, yeah. where we. You speak well. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Go no, on. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Devorim, where we basically sort of like skim through the, all the stories in the Torah. It's called Mishneh Torah. It's the, the repetition of the Torah. In Perak Yud Alef Pasuk Vov, source twenty five on your sheet. Moshe is referring to what happened with Korach, and he says, "The Asher Asal Dosan va Aviram Bnei Eliav Bnei Ben Reuven Asher Potsta Haoret Sets Piha Va Tivla Aim." And remember what happened with this episode where Dosan Aviram, the sons of Eliav, uh, sons of uh, sons of Reuven, when the earth opened their mouth and swallowed them. Guess who's not mentioned? No mention. No mention. No mention. The Rambam says, "What Velohis Ki Korach va Adasa." Why are you not, when you're retelling the story, you know, you're telling the story on the news and they say, no, you know, five years ago on the news and you just miss out Korach. So Rambam says, because really the people who were in charge of the rebellion were Dosan and Avira. Mm -hmm. So what I want to ask you, yeah. how is it possible that they were, have this merit of being saved and I haven't got time for it today. Again, a topic for another share. There is an opinion which says that the sea split, that the Yamsuf split. They had their private splitting of the sea. Another topic for another time. Wow. And how do they merit that? Because they were kind and they took a beating and cared about their Jewish brethren. So let me just ask you this question. How could they care so much about their Jewish brethren that somehow... They couldn't bear Moshe's authority. Yeah. So now, I thought about it, and obviously it's also to do with being beholden to Moshe, that he saved Dosan's life, and no one wants to be indebted to anybody. Um, I'd be interested to hear if any of you got any other thoughts on it.
okay so i'm bringing this um you can look at it if you want to on your phone if you take a picture of that little qr code if you like pretend to take a picture then you can bring up the page yourself this is something that i read i didn't read the actual paper myself but it's quoted um in psychology um today.com and um someone called douglas labia doug sorry douglas labia wrote in 90 in 2018 he quotes a paper written by harvard medical school and the paper is called Psychological Entitlement Predicts Failure to Follow Instructions. And the people who wrote this paper suggest that people with a greater sense of entitlement are less likely to follow instructions than less entitled people are. Someone who thinks they're so marvellous doesn't want to follow instructions because they view the instructions as an unfair imposition upon them. They would rather lose at something than to submit to the rule of others. Mm, now, if you think about that, um, there are people, for whatever reason, that they feel entitled. Perhaps they're part of aristocracy. Perhaps Dosan and Aviron felt they were from the tribe of Reuven. Perhaps they felt we were the Shotrim and now we're out of Egypt. We're not special anymore. Or, you know, or they were losing their job once the pe Jewish people, they weren't slaves in Egypt for the last few months of their slaves, people who feel entitled can't cope with other people telling them what to do. And once they left Egypt, then they got the Torah, and the episode of Korach happens after the laws of the Torah have been given, and they don't like, they don't like it that Moshe is dishing out the laws, they don't like it. But I'd like to bring it to some contemporary themes. What are you thinking? I'm thinking, what are you going to say? <laughs> oh, but you can suggest. Oh, you're wondering what I'm going to say. I thought you might have your own idea. Okay, I'll start the conversation flowing. Can you think of anyone who is in a position of authority and there are certain rules that someone, <laughs> somehow, they think those rules don't apply to them? You could possibly be talking about Boris. No. Well, I could be talking about plenty of people yeah. because with the COVID laws, the people who even made the laws yeah. Yeah. didn't Broken. keep the laws. Party gate, yeah. the yeah. fines, there was no party, we didn't have a party, we weren't there, no one was there. And then we've got the whole, I think you've all forgotten about, <coughs> Dominic Cummings, who yes. drove 260 yes. miles yes. from yes. Durham yes. because to see, and then he did a trip to check his eyesight to Barnard Castle. Really? If I would have got caught driving 60 miles from my house without yeah, a rule, remember the other people? I bet you've forgotten the names. I've researched it. Yes. Of, you know, well, of course, yes. the it's rule down. makers yeah. think they can be rule breakers. Yeah. Professor Neil Ferguson, who was the oh, government yes. scientist, yes. and he went to go and visit his girlfriend, yeah. even though he's married. Let's not go there either. <laughs> and on and on and on. And you know um, there was, the law. there's an article in The Guardian in May 2020 when all this was hotting up, and people said there's one rule for them. They, they, did a, they did a survey and they said 71% of respondents in The Guardian in um, 2020 said there's one rule for them and another rule for everyone else. Mm -hmm. I'm so upset that, that Cummings blatantly breaks the lockdown rules and the senior conservatives are lining up to defend him. Well, we now know why, because they were breaking the rules as well. <laughs> so I just want to... I don't quite understand because he just... Uh, if you compare Boris Johnson with, with a leader, supposedly, and Moshe? You're not comparing Moshe. I'm not comparing Moshe. Yeah. I'm comparing, I'm talking about Dos and Aviron, yeah, who had some, I didn't say they were the leaders. I'm saying that there are people, some people have got a certain yeah. air of entitlement and they think, I don't have to keep the rules. Yeah. There are plenty of people yeah. who park on the double yellow line or they, they, they don't care. They don't care they're blocking other people. Yeah. And they even think to themselves, yeah. I'll get away with it. Some people park where they're not allowed to park. Some people park where they, there are plenty of people. They park where they want to park, double park, across your driveway. They don't care. They think, if I get caught, I'll pay the fine, or I won't pay the fine, I'll get out of the fine. They don't care. Some people... So what I'm saying is, hiding here in this story of Korach is a story that, in fact, probably, according to some opinions, according to Archaim, the Dos and Laviram were actually really, really there. And what were they doing there? They really were good people, but somehow 
they felt entitled. Maybe they felt beholden to Moshe, or maybe they felt we're actually from the tribe of Reuven, and we should really be the royal family, and we deserve to have that place, and we don't want to be pushed about by some upstart who grew up in the palace. Who is he? Who does he think he's telling us what to do? And I'm suggesting that this is something that hiding in this story is something that is something that's very contemporary for us, especially about people, rule makers and rule breakers, and how some people just feel entitled and they think to themselves, I don't want I don't want someone else to tell me what to do. I don't want there to be a rule. They were going to have somebody else telling them what to do anyway. If Kochach was going to be But somehow you might say, well I don't mind if it's my if it's the person or maybe if they if if they were working together and he was in power, then they would have had some sort of special dispensation because mm -hmm. they would have been the ones who got him into power. He would have said, you know, if you get me into power I'll give you a seat at the cabinet. You know you're talking about uh, men putting a man in power, and with Moshe, you're talking about a man God putting in power. So the, mm. the I know, but the problem is, whoever's put the other person in power, if I don't like you being in power, I'm not willing to toe the line. Mm. And didn't, oh, sorry, for, but did they maybe not consider Moshe quite one of them? Because he didn't sort of... Well, he'd be brought up in the palace. He was 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 brought up in the palace. He didn't land up like there like as a slave. Like, yeah. Moshe was aware that these were his people. Mm. But were they aware exactly who he was? I know, that's, that's very interesting, but I think it boil that's maybe why Chazal see the, the story of Moshe intervening in this Egyptian and the, the Israelite, the two people fighting, has to be somehow linked to Dasan and Aviram because of what, what goes on. Why would they have been involved in the dispute? It just doesn't make sense. Anyway, that's plenty, plenty, plenty food for no, thought. No, so when, we, when, we, when you go to shul, and if you hear the, the, get there early to hear the first posuk, and when you hear who's in the headlines, Vayikach Korach ben Yitzhak ben Kos ben Levi, gives you his whole pedigree that he comes from Levi, the tribe of Levi, like Moshe comes from the house of Levi, for Dosan Ba'avir and Aliyov, and they're involved in the dispute. And remember when it says, Vayomru lo na'aleh, they said, we will not go up. How amazing Moshe was that he went out of his way to chase them and try and reconcile with them and that there should be some sort of reconciliation. And please God, we should not be involved in any disputes. And if there is someone in charge, we're okay with it. And not arguments. Keep away from arguments. And toe the line, don't double park. Don't park on <laughs> <my> the <dog. laughs> <laughs> like The moral of the evening is behave. <laughs> Isn't the source, and I, I had, I don't know where the source is, is that the reason that um, On disappears is because Mrs. On says, Oi, what is the point? So it'll be, uh, if Carrick's in charge, you, what are you going to get out of it? You're still going to be an underling, so what are you wasting your well, time Well, basically, for? a lot of disputes, people just get involved in disputes, and really they're not going to benefit from it either way. And then, you know, even if it's, if, even if it's a dispute that someone's got, let's say, with a neighbour or a small claims, you're going to argue and argue and argue, and the other person will make themselves bankrupt. You'll get nothing out of it. You've just got the endless aggravation. But some people, they just like arguing. So we say, like, we say, the Pirkei Ovis, it says, um, what machlokes is l'shem shamai? Him. So we say Hillel and Shammai, they argued for the truth and they stood up for what they thought was right in the Torah. But then we say, what's an argument that's not L'shem Shammai? And you know what the answer is? Korach v'chol adoso. We don't say Korach and Moshe, because really, Moshe's not in the dispute. As we say, it takes two to tango, it takes two to argue. Moshe was not arguing back. He did not want to argue. You can try and argue. Moshe was just not arguing back. Korach was in a dispute with his own Faction. There was everybody had their own reason for why they were going to join in. Maybe the the the, the two hundred fifty men had their reasons because they thought they were going to be leaders or they were the princes. The the people from Reuven thought we're the firstborn. The people from Levi thought we the Levites. And Moshe doesn't need to be there. So listen. The moral of the story is keep well away from disputes and um, beware of people who feel beware of people who feel entitled and watch their actions carefully. Everyone have a great week. Uh,